All right, welcome everyone to this Health Begins webinar on health equity, power, and the law. Uh, we're really, really excited that so many of you could be with us today. Um, and uh, just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. Um, we wanna let you know that this webinar will be recorded um, and we will be sending you a recording um, at, at the end of the webinar. <clears throat> Also, you should be automatically on mute when you enter the webinar. I'm Grace Rubenstein from Healthy Begins, by the way. <laughs> Just dove right in and to let you know who I am. Um, uh, so you should be automatically on mute. We ask you to remain that way, but we really, really wanna hear your questions. So you'll have an opportunity at any time to put your questions um, into the, the chat window. And we'll be monitoring those questions as we go and reserving time at the end to really dive into those. Uh, this should be a one hour presentation um, although you are on mute, if you are inclined to turn your camera on, we really love to see your faces and have a little bit of that interaction. Um, and with that, I am very pleased to hand it over to Health Begins President Rishi Manchanda. Grace, thank you so much. And hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to today's uh, conversation. This is um, uh, a big deal for us here at Health Begins, in part because uh, we recognize that over the last several years, uh, these types of webinars, these conversations have meant a lot uh, for us and the Health Begins team and for a lot of people in our network because these are uh, conversations at the leading edge. Uh, these are the pace setter conversations. And so in 2021, uh, starting with this webinar, we're gonna continue this by formally calling it our pace setter series. These are conversations, discussions with, with individuals and institutions from diverse backgrounds and fields who are at the leading edge of this movement. Uh, in each webinar, just like today, we're going to explore issues, raise awareness of emerging concepts, distill key insights, and, and try to focus in on concrete actions that health professionals and systems, as well as our partners in the community and public health and the social sector, the things that we can all do concretely to improve the social and structural drivers of health equity. So um, welcome to this, uh, this 2021 first installment of our Paysetter series. Um, uh, I am uh, Rishi Manchanda, I'm uh, at Health Begins, and we have a wonderful team joining us today. And I'm joined by two colleagues and, and two friends in this space for what's going to be a wonderful conversation. Uh, Ellen Lawton, um, Senior Fellow at Health Begins, formerly the Executive Director at the National Center for Medical Legal Partnerships, and Maha Jawayed, um, uh, Fellow at the NYU Center on International Cooperation, uh, formerly Acting Director for the Office for Access to Justice at the Department of Justice. Uh, Ellen, Maha, thank you so much. Um, we're going to hear from you in, in just a few moments. And as you all will certainly see, um, this is going to be a rich conversation talking about something that is certainly an important, um, long standing, but I think for many of us in the healthcare side, perhaps an emerging concept. And that's this idea of the political and legal determinants of health. We hope that by the end of this presentation, that each of you will be better able to describe the political and legal determinants of health, what that concept really means at a high level. Uh, as well as the, its relationship to health equity. Um, we, we hope that you'll be able to at least describe two strategies uh, to improve those legal determinants, especially looking at issues of legal aid and access to justice. And of course, we wanna make sure that we leave you with a sense of some concrete opportunities uh, to be able to help improve and shape those legal determinants. And, and by doing so, it help really transform the structures and the policies that shape the distribution of power, um, resources, and opportunities for health in the first place. So we have an ambitious um, agenda, but before we jump into our presentation today, let's get to know who you are. Um, I'll ask my colleague Grace to go and launch a poll now so you can all give us a sense of the kind of organization um, or association that you're part of. So go ahead and take a, about 30, 40 seconds to tell us who you are. What best describes your organization? Are you in a hospital, clinic, or healthcare delivery system, a health insurance plan or managed care organization, community-based organization or social service organization, human services, a public health agency or department or other. Great, seeing about 70% of voted so far, wonderful. Give it another 10 seconds here. See if we can get at least 80% of you to vote. Almost there. Great, let's go ahead and close the poll. And uh, hopefully you can now see the results. So it looks like uh, uh, an interesting mix of 
37% from the healthcare delivery side, um, another 36% to our other. If you said other, please go ahead and just tell us a bit more about the type of organization or uh, that you're a part of. Um, and also, if you wanna start putting in, into the chat now, just put your name and your organization affiliation in the chat, that way everybody can see um, where everybody else is coming in from. We have 235 participants uh, today. So go ahead and put your name and your organization in, and that'll give us a good sense, especially if you said other. 15% um, from CBOs, welcome, um, and uh, a small number from public health agencies and insurance plans. Uh, so welcome to all of you. We can stop sharing the, the poll now. Looks like we have a nice, a nice spread of participants. So now that we have a better sense of who we all are, let, let me tell some of you who may not be familiar with who we are about us, uh, Health Begins. Health Begins uh, was founded in 2012 uh, to initially be a professional home for uh, healthcare professionals who were motivated to better address uh, the social and structural drivers of health equity, both for our patients individually, but also um, ways that we could support efforts at the community and broader level um, as well. Uh, in 2017, it became full-time, uh, what went from a labor of love kind of um, initiative, became a full-time effort now with um, partners across the country, and we've had the privilege of working alongside organizations and allies to be able to move upstream. Our mission is to simply inspire and drive radical transformation in health equity. And we do that by helping existing and emerging leaders in healthcare, public health, and community organizations to move upstream. Uh, that means to improve the social and the structural drivers of health equity. Let me unpack a little bit more of what we, that definition, what it means to move upstream. A lot of people use this phrase these days. We mean something very specific by it. To us, moving upstream means to continuously improve the social and structural drivers of health equity at all levels. Individual social needs, community level social determinants of health, and of course, broader structural determinants of health equity, including issues like structural racism. It's that last part that we really want to uh, lean in on today as we set the table for this conversation today. Structural determinants of health. Just to unpack that a bit more, uh, this is a familiar, for many of you, a familiar um, diagram from our friends at the Bay Area Regional Health Inequities Initiative uh, developed many years ago. We've adapted it slightly here and just to draw your attention to the circled areas. Um, you can see here towards the right issues, you know, risk behaviors, disease, um, ultimate, you know, mortality. These are downstream um, manifestations of what are decidedly upstream uh, drivers living conditions or what we would call the social determinants of health, uh, as well as in this circle here on the left, the structural drivers, the institutional policies, the law, the ways in which corporations, government agencies, schools, regulations, all these things shape um, social determinants. When we're thinking about today's conversation, it's this understanding of the way in which policy and the law and, and power um, is shaped uh, that really informs, I think, uh, what needs to be a broadening understanding from our perspective of how we can truly move upstream and not just address individual social needs while necessary and critically important, but also think about our role in healthcare and in communities to uh, help address these broader structural issues. So with that structural concept in mind, you know, we wanted to unpack that this is the basic uh, flow of things um, from and many, many um, organizations from the World Health Organization, the CDC, and many leading thinkers, of course, for the past 20 years have articulated that the structural drivers, the structural determinants of health equity, as Kamara Jones calls it, shape the distribution and access to power, resources, opportunity, and justice. And that distribution, that access to power, resources, opportunity, and justice, that itself then shapes the community level social determinants of health, the where food deserts exist or where there may or may not be access to affordable housing, et cetera. And those social determinants, those community level conditions then ultimately shape the individual social needs, the distribution of social needs, the who disproportionately experiences them or not based on um, structural issues. And so when we think about that, this, this terminology, there's some key concepts we want to elevate here. And uh, for today, we're gonna focus in on uh, the law specifically, the legal determinants of health and touch on political determinants as well. But these over the course of our pay sitter series are issues that we're gonna to continue to elevate in 2021 because it's time to get a lot more sophisticated and a lot more um, concrete in understanding how we all can play a more significant role in addressing these questions. So key questions for today, now that I've set the table, what are these legal determinants of health? Uh, how does access to legal aid and justice impact health equity? 
And what are some concrete strategies that health systems can use to help pursue what um, many call health with justice? So those are some key questions. We invite you to um, start putting questions or comments that you might have in the chat. Um, anytime we're gonna come back to those at the Wireside chat part of it, but to kick us off into answering some of these high level questions. Um, it is my distinct pleasure to turn it first to um, my colleague, Ellen Lawton, um, who is now senior fellow at Health Begins. Ellen, um, the floor is yours. Tell me when to advance the slides. Great, thanks Rishi and welcome everybody. I'm really excited for this conversation with you and I can already see starting to burn up the chat a little bit uh, with commentary. And I also see a lot of my, uh, my medical legal partnership and legal aid friends out there. So I see you and uh, please uh, keep me honest. Um, so uh, can we go to the next slide? Thank you, Rishi, for uh, teeing this up uh, so eloquently uh, so that we can have a conversation today about law and health and health equity. Um, I'm sharing with you in the way that lawyers do, we need to start with a definition. And uh, this tidy definition is drawn from the 2019 uh, report of the Lancet Commission on the legal determinants of health. Uh, so we're gonna provide a link to that report for you. Um, and uh, it details uh, a lot of what uh, Rishi was sharing uh, up top, which is how law and political determinants of health create these social drivers. And so my goal today is to, as Rishi said, try to get a little bit more concrete about uh, what we know, uh, what the uh, environment is, and then how can we be more effective uh, at um, creating change. So law affecting health by structuring, perpetuating, and mediating the social determinants of health. Uh, we're going to be focusing in a particular area of law for most of this conversation. So let's get grounded a little bit. Um, Grace, do you want to launch this poll? We want to find out um, a basic threshold question in the law is what's the difference between civil and criminal justice systems? I'd love to see uh, who in the audience, and I know you're out there lawyers, so you can participate, it's okay. Um, but also folks that aren't lawyers, uh, does that uh, distinction make a difference for you? Do you understand what that means? And the reason that we're asking, you know, we can talk about when we see the poll results. Um, I can't see um, how many folks are weighing in, but Grace, you'll let me know when we hit 80% there. We, yes, we've got, mm -hmm. I'd say, five seconds to go. Log your votes, Okay, everybody. great. I'm dying to know. We'll find out, you know, how much TV people are watching and also how many lawyers we have on the line here. So <laughs> there we go. Okay, great. A uh, lot of 68% of you know the difference between civil and criminal justice systems. Um, and then a couple of you are here to brush up. That's great. So th why am I asking that question? After spending, you know, almost 20 years in a healthcare setting, seeing patient clients, uh, one of the things I realized is we have to meet healthcare partners where they are, and that includes understanding language differences. And so this is basic uh, distinction, almost like um, acute and chronic care in the healthcare setting. And so uh, Civil law refers to a deprivation, this is a very broad definition, deprivation of property or rights, while criminal law is referring generally to a deprivation of liberty. Um, and what we're going to focus on today is the um, uh, civil legal system and how that affects health. So next slide, Rishi. Okay, so it's complicated, right? I'm walking around in a body like this every day, but I don't know how it works. <laughs> I don't know these specifics. A lot of the healthcare people that are uh, participating right now understand exactly what you're looking at here, um, but it requires expertise, specific language, and uh, a, a particular uh, vocabulary. Um, and so lawyers, of course, have their own expertise and vocabulary, and there you go. So this is a journey in a, uh, for an individual through the criminal justice system. And we cultivate our own kind of complexity in the legal world. And the stakes are super high in the criminal justice system. And the same can be said in the civil justice system in 
housing court, immigration court, and really any other civil court setting. Um, and so one way to think about our conversation today is if we can all agree, and I think we probably can, that stable, affordable housing is foundational to health. Um, is the entire health sector getting on board with what it takes to meet that need for our patient clients and communities, right? So um, are we ready in the healthcare sector to dig in a little deeper into complex systems like this one and partner with the experts in systems like this one to try to change uh, the housing crisis in our communities? Or are we still thinking, mm, that's not my job? Next slide. Okay, the good news is we have really come a long way. So we have made progress. Um, this is from a pediatric resident training in the late 90s. And it was filled out by a pediatric resident who was doing a training with us where the resident basically fessed up, as you can see here, uh, to not voting, not knowing who their representatives are, and only knowing who the president of the United States was. I do think we've come a long way in helping to train healthcare uh, team members to understand better uh, how to exercise their voice in a variety of ways. Um, but we also have a ways to go. Um, so this is shocking to me, and it goes to the meet them where they are, because when lawyers are studying, they're studying systems of government. And so these are very uh, clear places where we have expertise. But we came to realize in working with physicians and nurses and others that, you know, they were studying review of systems. They weren't necessarily thinking about the branches of government. And so we have to meet people where they are and help build those muscles for this kind of engagement really at the most specific level. Next slide. Okay, to get super analog with you, um, again, looking to the past, but also looking to the future. This is a tool that we used all the time uh, to do training with uh, residents that were on the move and physicians and nurses and medical students, um, asking about their patients and just crowdsourcing. Like, what are the things that your patients need? What are the families that you're dealing with every day? What do they need? And these were the types of topics that people would, uh, residents and, and physicians and nurses would talk about, you know, here are the problems that our patients are bringing to us that are getting in the way of them staying healthy. And so over time, we saw consistently light bulb moments that were routinely shared by uh, people on the front lines of healthcare was the realization that you can see each of these domains school and SNAP benefits and health and transportation, all governed by different systems. Oh, there we go. All governed by different systems, different laws, regulations, applications, and eligibility. And that is part of what the overwhelming administrative disincentive leads to and the disconnection that um, families and individuals have from systems that are supposed to support and promote health. And so it becomes apparent that you really do need to have a lawyer to help be part of the team to secure these types of benefits, all of which were designed allegedly to support uh, and promote health. So one key factor to think about here is when this happens on the individual level, a big part of the conversations with frontline healthcare providers is really understand your power and to use it. And that's part of what this is all about today, I think, is helping each of us to understand what our power is and how to use it more effectively. Next slide. So you've heard now the sort of foundations for medical legal partnership. And I know some of you are right out there um, listening in and again, uh, really look forward to your comments and perspective in the chat, um, but we are making the case here for why it is that in the 21st century, we really believe that you can't be effective at promoting health and public health without incorporating the legal sector. We know it works, 
there are study, there was a study at the VA uh, where veterans who received full legal representation showed significant reductions in symptoms of mental illness. Veterans who received medical legal partnership services showed greater improvements in housing and substance abuse and mental health. And just to unpack a little bit, when we say medical legal partnership, what are we talking about? We're talking about embedding lawyers as members of the healthcare team. And here on the, uh, the pizza wedge, uh, you can see the different types of activities that promote that kind of transformation from individual patient interventions to training the healthcare team to clinic level changes that are gonna make it easier for healthcare team members to meet patients' needs. And then that uh, upstream, real upstream strategy around policy change that is derived from frontline uh, patient experience. So it's a vast chasm of need that we're seeing more than ever um, around the country and it's a pretty, um, uh, I would say, scarce resource, the public interest legal services. But if we know the power that they have and we can move that, um, that capacity upstream, we think we can have a much more significant impact both on communities and also on policy. So I'm going to end on this note. Next slide. Here we go. Uh, our friend James Teufel, who shared uh, a, a, you know, frightening but also uh, unsurprising stat, which is that people spend more on Halloween costumes for their pets than the go federal government will spend on civil legal aid. And you know what? I think it's because the impact of civil legal aid has been largely invisible to this point. And so our job together, I think, in the healthcare sector, public health sector, and the legal sector is to elevate the uh, importance and relevance and opportunity for incorporating civil legal aid as part of a robust healthcare team in order to transform and hold accountable those systems that were designed to uh, provide support and assistance for people who are low income and struggling. So I'm going to stop there. Um, and I want to hand it over to my colleague, Maha Jue. And Maha, do you want to take it away? Absolutely. <clears throat> Thank you, Ellen. And, and thanks to the Health Begins team. It's really, it's a pleasure to be here. So um, I'm going to, I'll go ahead to the next slide. It's weird to see your face in multiple places. So I, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, uh, my, my experience in the federal government, primar primarily during the Obama Biden years with respect to access to justice and how political leadership really was such a necessary ingredient to advancing these issues we're talking about, both in the health sector, but really in many other places in which the patients and clients that are served by these systems um, experience needs. So I'll talk about that access to justice experience under the Obama Biden administration this global movement on justice that also really has benefited from political leadership across the globe. And then finally give a little bit of some reflections on how I see some political courage being really um, developed because of COVID-19 and the realities there. Um, so the, the office that I had come from, we can go to the next slide. Um, it was really, it's a case study on political leadership. It was formed in 2010 by Attorney General Holder if you can imagine, it's the first time that an office existed in the executive branch focusing on issues of access to justice. You can see the abbreviated mission statement here, help the justice system efficiently deliver outcomes that are fair and accessible to all regardless of wealth and status. Very tall order. We were a policy office. That meant we didn't do uh, investigations of systems with respect to the provision of either criminal right to counsel or civil legal aid, which is essentially what the office was considering. We also were not a grant making component. So we were not administering funds to any of the systems that provide those services. So instead it was sort of this but for clause, but for the political leadership at the time, we were would have been not as successful in really advancing the work of the office, which was to really look across government and identify places in which including access to justice strategies could help ensure that the federal government's priorities would be advanced. 
And really in this particular area, I'll focus on, um, with respect to health, I'd focus on the work of this very large interagency effort called the Legal Aid Interagency Roundtable that was started in 2012 and then elevated by President Obama in 2015 to a White House initiative that stretched across 22 agencies and identifying how to incorporate both civil legal aid and other sorts of responses, primarily on the civil system as Ellen described, but somewhat also on the criminal system, I should say, with respect to advancing these federal objectives from employment, family stability, housing, et cetera, and then importantly here, health. Um, really this, this political, I'm, I'm happy to say that the interagency effort continued on under the last, the prior administration, uh, regrettably, the office itself was closed in 2018 by Attorney General Sessions, but the work of the interagency roundtable continued uh, a bit more muted, I would say, than it, than really how it existed prior, but still uh, a, a testament to the fact that this work is bipartisan and just requires leadership to really advance the work. And again, in the health area, the model of medical legal partnership that Ellen described was really a perfect um, uh, vehicle to advance the work across government. Um, you know, there was parts of, of Health and Human Services, Veterans Affairs, DOJ itself, the Corporation for National Community Service, which runs the AmeriCorps programs, the Bureau of Indian Affairs of the Department of the Interior, all of these agencies uh, through this interagency effort really looked to identifying ways in which their funding, their policy priorities, their ability to do research, other resources that they could unlock could really advance this work. And bottom line is that the leadership that existed from the highest points of government uh, really allowed us to uh, you know, really turbocharge this work together. Um, I'll just note here too, with respect to the topic at hand, health equity in particular, President Biden um, has done a lot of executive action we've seen in the, in, the, in the month that he's been in office. And really in the first two days, there's two particular um, uh, executive orders that interest me and I think interest this community. One is on the equitable pandemic response and recovery, ensuring that. And the second one is on advancing racial equity. And looking at those EOs, to me, reflect very much similarly what this interagency effort did. I'll say President Obama, when he elevated the work, he also issued a presidential memorandum that laid out its um, objectives and its activities. And there's a lot uh, of similarities across the different ways in which government can be activated. So um, a lot to possibly happen in this area that I think we would all be really interested in. Uh, and then I'll go to the next slide. So at the same time that this work was happening at the federal level, there was also a, the global movement on justice really taking hold. And I won't go totally into the sustainable development goals. I, I, I hope and I, I think probably a lot of folks here know some about the SDGs as they're called, but just to confirm that there, there are these 17 goals that in 2015, uh, the UN members adopted to help uh, advance efforts around ending extreme poverty while taking into consideration climate change. And these goals have often been viewed as development tools. In other words, um, ways in which you might encourage the US Agency for International Development and the development agencies of Canada, the UK, et cetera, to consider how to advance their priorities and their work in a more harmonized way. But the really wonderful thing about the SDGs is that there's a universality feature to them. And so really that also means that in the US, there is efforts being taken, again, in the prior ministry, in the Obama years more directly, but even in state and local governments as to how to use this framework to advance efforts to end poverty. And so we can see, I've only popped out a few of these here, but to see goal three, of course, is health and well-being, and to note goal 16, which is the access to justice goal and also includes issues with respect to peace and strong institutions. Uh, there's been a lot of real effort to um, really advance this work in a very um, honest, honest way. And I'll say goal 16 was, it took a lot of political will to include it and to really advance the idea that in fact, justice is a, is a means of ending extreme poverty. And as I described a moment ago with the federal work that I was a part of, access to justice is its own priority, certainly, but it's also an enabler of other priorities. So likewise, goal 16 is seen as a goal in, in and of itself, but also as a requirement to advance the other goals that are listed here. Um, you know, I, I'll say what's been really interesting is that uh, the conversation at the global level on justice allows countries to speak with honesty about everyone failing in this space. And that's very refreshing that you would go into these conversations and everyone can share 
that in fact, they're all not doing it in the way that should be done. And what came out of this effort also was a task, this, this global task force on justice that was launched by an organization I work with, the Pathfinders for Peaceful, Just and Inclusive Societies at NYU Center on International Cooperation. Uh, they pulled together some really important individuals. It was chaired by uh, government ministers from Argentina, the Netherlands, Sierra Leone, um, the elders, which was founded by uh, Nelson Mandela. And they really look to identify what these issues look like at the global setting, at the global stage, as well as what are the what are the problems that different countries face together. So the next slide is going to be another poll opportunity. And this is in the in the task force's work, they were able to, for the first time, try to quantify what the global justice gap is. So if we can launch that poll question, it's written here as well. Um, I wrote before the pandemic because the report came out in 2019, but how many people in the world were estimated to lack meaningful access to justice. So here are some options, 1.4 billion, 3.7 billion, 5.1 billion. And again, before the pandemic, because certainly after the pandemic, we'll imagine these numbers will have grown. So I don't know when the right time is to shut this down. I can keep talking, but my next slide actually has the answer. So I don't wanna advance until we feel like uh, we're at a place where it might be okay to. We'll give it about five more seconds for everybody to chime in. Excellent. So I'll just say, you know, the, this, this task force produced a report in 2019. Uh, it had this, oh, let's see. Ah, excellent, 51%. So let's go to the next slide. And you will see, in fact, that the majority of the folks here uh, did, in fact, uh, guess the right amount, which I'm, of course, excited about, but actually is quite troubling. And, and truly, two thirds of the world's population have been uh, estimated to lack meaningful access to justice. Again, this is the first time that that's been quantified. And so really has been a driver of the conversations across all GDP levels, all countries at different income levels to really have a sense of what this issues might look like. Also in the report included these six common justice problems in terms of what people are facing. And you can take a look, they look very much like the, the um, graphic that Ellen shared with a person in the middle and the issues coming out from them, you know, violence and safety, land issues, housing issues, uh, family disputes, debt issues, and employment or business issues. So, you know, all to say um, what, what really this, this global effort has done has demonstrated that there's commonality no matter where you live. And that, whereas we might think that if you are in a higher income uh, country, you might have better opportunities to obtain the sorts of services you need to uh, have, a, have a more, um, a safer existence in life that truly uh, justice issues are common across the globe. So this work has led to greater engagement in other spaces like at the UN, of course, but the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, I'll say, I know Ellen has presented activity, uh, the MLP model to activity happening there, and it's been lifted up at the global level as well, open government partnership. And in fact, last year, as we all experienced this, this virtual world, there have been far many more conversations around these issues, again, um, uh, the, really focusing on the ways in which we all are, are struggling to meet the obligations that we have to our, our communities in order to, to really address their needs. Um, if I can go to the, so before I go to the next, it's okay, we can stay on the slide. And it's just to say that again, this, this, com this, this connection between justice and all these other sectors is something that continually can be driven through education. Obviously we're doing that with each other today but then also through this political will that, that really requires capital being spent to be able to discuss what these issues mean. And that's, that's sort of the magic related to all this work that it's easy to overlook this, these issues if, if you're not really wanting to look at them. And so um, having a global perspective and push on these issues has really helped to open up the conversations in ways that are, that are helpful, I think. So then my, my last slide is just to, just to sort of a uh, random thought in, in preparing for today's um, conversation. And that is sort of my reflections on what COVID-19 has done in terms of creating some political courage that I find very interesting and, and, and remarkable. And that is with respect to considering new ways of doing justice in this country. So yeah, on the left side of the screen, I won't read everything. It's a, it's a really full slide. I know you'll get these materials, but the Equal Justice Initiative in Alabama, a really remarkable institution, Brian Stevenson, as many of you know, has, at least this organization, they're doing a wonderful job of, of cataloging what it means for COVID-19 on, on individuals in prisons and, and jails. And they continue to update this page that they have here. 
Um, they, you know, report that the infection rates are five times the national average for people who are incarcerated. And what's interesting is that, especially in the pretrial context, where these are people who are charged with a crime but have not yet been convicted of a crime, you know, states and localities do do hold people in uh, in different ways. But bottom line is, there's a ter terrible situation of having a, a money system, a money bill system, whereas if you have the means to get out pretrial, uh, and, and often what happens is that if you're charged with a crime, a local jurisdiction may have a schedule that says this, this offense requires this money to get out until your trial date, versus the federal system, which by and large tends to be around a flight risk, whether you might be a flight risk before your trial date or a safety risk. But in, in many jurisdictions across the country, instead they rely on this money schedule, which essentially says if you have the means to buy your freedom for the bit of time before, it's not a bit of time, for the time before trial, you can do so. And there's, of course, a really robust pretrial reform movement. But there's been an interesting reality that actually because of COVID and the rates of infection for people who are detained and incarcerated, that you know, localities and governors and legislatures have been willing to try things differently. And so here's a couple of examples on the right side of the slide, the ways in which people are being sent home uh, during their during the pretrial period, maybe with an ankle monitor or some other condition of release. Maybe they're being sent home because their sentence is almost over, um, more moratoriums that are happening. And to me, it's been like a uh, pilot project that we could never have uh, ever obtained, but for this really horrible time in our community and in, in the world writ large. So just to say, my, my hope is that we are able to capture these, uh, these opportunities to measure what's impacted by, by these realities and actually demonstrate that in fact, we can do justice differently in this country. And really here it's, but for the health uh, you know, consequences that we weren't able to try these things. So I'll stop here and pass it back over to Rishi um, for our conversation. Well, Maha and Ellen, thank you so much. Um, as uh, you guys will now be able to see in the chat, there's a robust, healthy, um, both dialogue and set of questions coming in. Um, I want to encourage everybody online to keep on doing so. Um, let me elevate a couple of things in a, in a minute here that I'm seeing from the, the chat um, and also reflect back on what each of you shared. Um, one of the things that uh, each of you touched upon is, I think Ellen, you did so directly and, and uh, Maha, you put it into the global context as well. It, was you know under defining the, the law as a mediator of as a as a determinant right of of health the way it structures perpetuates mediates and that language I think directly comes from one report that I found pretty seminal in thinking about what the legal determinants of health are what does this mean what does legal aid and justice have to do with health um, and some of the key messages here on the left you can see from this report that came out in 2019 uh, we'll include the link to this so you guys can see in the chat. But uh, that, that law does, as you said, Ellen, in your presentation, affect health in multiple ways by structuring, perpetuating, and mediating the social determinants. And that because law has been central to major public health achievements in the past, um, it has capacity to advance global health with justice. And I, and I put that in bold because that really resonated with me. It felt like a way to be able to speak to um, the broader social determinants of health, the broader upstream kind of um, space and thinking about how to understand and address the legal determinants. This, this health with justice phrase really caught me. Um, and what they're saying is the capacity to advance health with justice remains substantially underutilized, particularly among professionals in the fields of health and science. Are, are we just not doing enough to be able to become aware of how we can tap into the power of the law and, um, and public health law? So there's a, there's a graph here on the right um, from that report uh, where they start defining effective legal interventions and you can see equity uh, promoting and engaging sectors beyond health and there's, there's such a robust kind of deep set of thinking about what the legal determinants of health are but this concept of health with justice and the opportunity to pursue that uh, really kind of resonated with me and as we go into now this dialogue let me start with the first round of questions and then we'll pull in questions from the chat um, as I do so everyone um, online continues sharing those questions and if you also, um, if your institution has examples of ways in which you're working to improve you know, access to legal aid or justice um, or broader legal determinants of health at whatever level, individual, community, or even at a national level, please share those examples in the chat. We, we understand that many of you are, are experts in this space alongside um, our two presenters today. So uh, Ellen and Mahat, let me go with the first round here. Um, we're talking now about these pretty major issues, right? Access to legal aid, the civil 
um, legal justice system and the criminal legal justice system, uh, the access to justice. And Maha, you, you spoke really clearly about the, the fact that political drivers uh, really do determine whether access to justice, the legal you know, drivers can actually become a priority. Can you give us some examples now looking at that kind of national perspective and these big weighty kind of concepts? Drive it home for us. Are there some examples of clients or, or patients you know, or stories that you've heard of where these issues really become crystal clear for a lot of folks, especially those in health systems? Um, Ellen, I'll turn it to you first if you want to give us an example. What does this look like? What does the, the limitation to the access to legal aid mean actually in day-to-day -day life? Sure. And, and with the caveat, thanks, Rishi, for that. Um, and with the caveat that a lot of times people have legal problems and they don't see them as legal problems. They see mm -hmm. them as just problems. And mm -hmm. so that they uh, don't necessarily have a solution. Um, and so what I would say is, I think we can all imagine, especially over the past year, we've heard about housing uh, instability. And so many people are one or two paychecks away from not being able to make rent. And uh, so they may not have an eviction notice yet, or they may uh, have just gotten their eviction notice. And I just want to hat tip to Emily Benfer uh, and, um, and the work that she's been doing uh, to uh, talk about eviction and elevate that issue as a health justice issue, um, because that's a very real one that's happening in all of our neighborhoods and all of our communities around the country. Um, and so what it looks like is a problem. It's a money problem. That's actually a housing problem and a, a health problem. And so um, how do you you know, how do you respond as a healthcare professional to a patient who says, you know, I got an eviction notice from my, uh, my landlord. And do you say that sounds like a terrible thing? I don't know how to help you. Or is there, you know, something that you can do to hopefully prevent that eviction? Um, and mm -hmm. so that's, that's where legal aid comes in. That is, but that's exactly what it looks like is an overwhelming problem that will take um, the priority off of any type of, you know, clinical treatment that you're pursuing as a healthcare provider. Mm -hmm. um, and it's going to take all the energy and, uh, and focus that the family has to try to avoid um, becoming homeless and uh, really demands a, a very um, mm -hmm. skilled response. Uh, so I, mm -hmm. if that answers the question, yeah. <laughs> but that's how it shows up. That's what a deprivation of, uh, of law uh, of justice looks like is it starts with a um, starts with an eviction notice and uh, looking for help um, mm -hmm. and potential homelessness. Yeah, I think that's a it's a particularly compelling thing. As I turn over to Maha, like the it, it's a compelling and provocative uh, frame to look at all these social needs that many health professionals now are be, are trying to address in their health systems. Many health systems are trying to address the social determinants at a community level that increasingly are of interest to those in healthcare. And to look at that um, as, as manifestations of deprivations of justice, <laughs> right? To mm -hmm. view those as the, that, that each of those has, um, you know, a legal and a, um, a, a rights kind of based kind of framework deprivation of legal, you know, aid on the civil side or deprivation of liberty as you said on the criminal side. Um, it, it, I think it's a, it's a provocative, um, it kind of frame to look at this. And Maha, as I turn to you, uh, several questions have come up and rightly so about equity, um, health equity. And you, of course, spoke to that. At the local and the national and maybe international level, as there, as you mentioned, you know, as we get a better sense of the pervasive uh, lack of access to justice, you know, 5.1 billion people lacking that. Uh, can you speak more to whatever data um, exists at whatever level, national, local, or international, about the disproportionate burden of that of, of that barrier of the lack of access um, for communities of color, black, brown um, communities, especially in the U.S. What do we know about the this? I, I know Equal Justice Initiative, and many have been talking about this explicitly, but I wanted to pause here and elevate that. Several people in the chat have also um, pointed to the disparities and the inequities um, along uh, race and economic lines. Yeah, without doubt. I mean, without a doubt our country has systems of structural inequities that exist that just are, you know, we talk about intersectionality often. It's like, it's me, I'm a woman and I'm this ethnicity and I'm this, 
but there's also intersectionality of need. And so with respect to all of the issues that, again, going back to Ellen's really great graphic of the person in the middle, all the things that stem out from there, you can, you, we know that there's these structural barriers that exist in health, in justice, in education, employment, et cetera, that are just amplified. And there's a snowball effect because of issues such as race and uh, marginalization and underserving certain communities that you know are historical in our country. I'll say, um, I, I will put this in the chat. I feel like the Health Begins team has been so wonderful. They've been adding, and this, I didn't send this, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna add it in a moment myself, but the Legal Defense Fund um, has a series of briefs. There's one that was issued in May of 2020 on structural racism is a public health crisis. Um, it's interesting because it was issued in May before the George Floyd murder and the, the, the real movement in the summer. And the reason why I say that they hit on the justice system here, but I, I want more, I want to put more, I, you know, there's more actually out there than what's even in this. But the, the truth is our systems have been set up in a way that, that ex excludes people. There's no doubt for that. And so knowing that in fact, the ways in which we look at COVID and the rates of Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, that the health impacts on people of communities of color with COVID. But then we also look, you know, I saw it in the chat, it's absolutely true. The rates of incarceration in this country also are, the, the proportion is much higher for communities of color too. So we have yet another place in which we're exposing individuals and communities uh, from communities of color to higher rates of, mm -hmm. of illness because in fact of the way in which our system is set up that has bias and uh, mm -hmm. in the system. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think one of the things that uh, clearly we've started to do in this conversation today is to start to unpack in, in really concrete ways what the legal determinants of health are, uh, specifically around, you know, legal aid and, and access to justice issues on the, on the criminal and the civil um, legal side. Uh, now let's pivot actually to concrete strategies to be able to address them, especially thinking about what health professionals, health systems and our allies, you know, in, in the law and social sectors can do to address them. A couple of concrete strategy kind of related questions. There's questions, for example, from uh, several questions relating to the medical legal partnership model itself. Uh, um, and Ellen, uh, you know, feel free, both of you feel free to answer questions directly in the chat. But for example, from Lisa Sandor, a question about um, the, the extent to which, uh, I think Lisa, you mentioned that there's a, a lot of uh, clients with disabilities um, that, that you support and that you serve and wondering about how legal aid might be helpful to address um, access to benefits. Um, or other kind of challenges experienced by people um, with disabilities. Um, Ellen, can you speak a little bit about the, just uh, maybe for a quick minute, uh, just for two minutes actually, <laughs> just about MLP and how that service model um, is helpful when it comes to client-based kind of services and whether well, it's Lisa's question or more broadly. Yeah, and I also, thanks Rishi, and I also saw another question in the chat uh, about um, downstream impacts and upstream impacts and how can we move medical legal partnership impacts right. more upstream. And yep. so, and I think that that is exactly what we need to focus our attention on in the medical legal partnership world. And um, and so part of, part of the opening gambit for medical legal partnership is really cementing that connection between the health professionals and the legal sector. And the legal aid attorneys act almost like primary care attorneys, where they can be the bridge to the rest of the legal community for those healthcare professionals, right? So I see a lot in the chat about, oh, in Utah, we do this, and in Missouri, we do that, right? It's very, very idiosyncratic how the legal community that serves low-income populations is organized. And, and so you need that cultural broker uh, into the legal community. And that's part of what Medical Legal Partnership does, is it helps the health professionals to leverage the existing services out in the mm -hmm. field. And then also think about what are the policy solutions so that you're not helping 15 people uh, who have food stamp issues, but in fact, you're working on the policy change. And the voice, I can't say it strongly enough, the voice of the health system and the healthcare provider is different and in many ways more impactful at moving the dial on policy. Um, because legal aid has the expertise and they have the insight, but they are kind of the usual suspects around policy change and they need new messengers that sit alongside them with a different perspective um, and, and different kind of gravitas in the community. Mm -hmm. So I would say that's also an important facet. Yeah, thank you. And I think that's, uh, you're, you're answering this other question, the, the, the policy opportunities, the chances for service models like uh, 
MLPs to extend not just to care for individuals, but also now to start policy issues. I'm wondering if, uh, Maha, if you want to um, speak to that a bit more, especially if there's any kind of concrete opportunities, you referred to some of them, um, you know, in your presentation, opportunities for whether it's ML, whether a health professional health system is involved with a MLP or, or not, are there opportunities to be able to engage and support, not to be the lead on, uh, right, but to at least engage and support efforts to address these um, access to justice issues, access to legal aid at a policy level? Absolutely. And, you know, I will, um, I'll plug Ellen's former gig, the National Center for Medical Legal Partnership. Hey. I'll question here, there's a lot of resources to be able to educate yourself, even if your uh, own practice or the hospital or the center that you work in doesn't have an established MLP, to just start to become more aware. And, and, and it's almost like what I find interesting, Ellen's absolutely right, having the medical profession behind this effort is much more impactful than the lawyers. However, it's the lawyers who get it a little bit quicker because they they know that their clients are coming in the door with all these issues and they're so diverse. Whereas, you know, I come from a family of doctors, not lawyers. And when I talk about mm -hmm. medical legal partnership, they say to me, you're talking about malpractice. Like, are you gonna sue us? So for, for, for the medical profession, involvement of lawyers tends to be this adversarial issue. Whereas for lawyers, we tend to understand a little bit more about um, more of the holistic issues that the clients come in because it's so diverse with respect to their needs. I mean, I will say also there was a question in here on, on rural. And so another idea in terms of what you can do, uh, number one, if you are in, a, in an area where you have a university system, even if your system isn't part of it, is there a law school that is nearby that, that you can even consider having, you know, finding out do they have clinics? A lot of law schools in the ways that I know the medical schools do too, in terms of, you know, medical school is more direct clinical teaching. Law schools, it's it's by choice. Not all law schools really have excellent clinical programs, but some do. So being able to see if there are clinics in your in the law school clinics that are nearby that you might want to engage with, there could be some very practical, simple things. The other thing I'll say for rural communities is the Indian Health Services uh, service, rather part of HHS, has been really good on this in terms of really thinking about how to better serve their communities, and so. Um, I'm in particular, I'm thinking about in the Navajo Nation, there's been some really wonderful, and this is actually thanks to Ellen that I met them, wonderful doctors um, in the Navajo Nation who understand and value the collaboration with the, with the, the legal aid uh, organization, DNA People's Legal Services. And that has grown to many more collaborations between uh, Indian Legal Services, which is part of the legal aid system that serves tribal communities and medical facilities, including in Alaska. So anyway, there's a whole stream of that that might be an opportunity for you to look into. But I think the easiest and simplest thing to do is to brush up on the MLP model, see if there's one nearby, and if there isn't, to sort of start talking to your local legal aid organization. And I'll just say, it is not easy for these partnerships to blossom without funding and resources. So I don't mean to say just pick up the yeah. phone and the legal aid program is gonna be able to partner with you, but that's where then looking for the political opportunities that we were describing might come into hand where right. you can see and there's funding here or there that might allow for you to consider how to partner in a way that's supported through resources. Yeah, well, the resources yeah, and funding. I, yeah, oh, go ahead, Ellen. Yep. I was going to hop in on the resources and funding because uh, there's some chat in there. And absolutely, um, they're beleaguered agencies that are overwhelmed uh, and they're not looking for more uh, cases, candidly, without resources that are attached to them, but they are looking for partnerships that are meaningful and sustainable, and that's what we're seeing happen around the country, um, is that as people, you know, as those services and the value becomes more visible, you start to see the engagement and the potential for sustainable resources, and we have the, the National Center, some great um, uh, case studies on that, including a terrific subscription service in Montana that uh, speaks to exactly that, right? It's paying towards legal services to be part of the healthcare team. I, uh, I wanted to tackle, if it's okay, um, there's a there was a question in the chat about, you know, can we focus on policy change only because that seems like where the, the challenge is? And I think policy change is really important. Don't get me wrong, but a lot of times what uh, what needs to be thought through is actually how are those policies accountable on the front on the um, in the community and with individuals. So the policy is actually fine, but there's a disconnect between the access 
and uh, the services that the patient is entitled to or should be getting. And so the policy change is really crucially important, but we also need that accountability that's, that can only happen, I think, in the type of medical legal partnership setup where you've got you know, some individual patients that are kind of reflecting the broken policies and you're able to ensure that there's an accountability and um, um, an alignment with good policy and that you're tackling the poor policies. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just two quick things on the, on the funding side is to build on uh, this. I think a, a couple of questions came in around, you know, is, is Medicaid funding a possible kind of path to be able to support sustainability, especially for organizations like um, Anna Gorman put in the chat, you know, the experience of LA yeah. County with medical legal partnerships. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's an interesting opportunity um, to discuss as well as I think what you're all speaking to. And I think in the chat, um, a few folks have even mentioned this, that, you know, there really hasn't been substantial, maybe it was um, Sue Crimson, uh, if I'm tracking correctly with who put that in there. But uh, several have mentioned that there hasn't been a substantive kind of investment in legal services and access to legal aid, as you uh, all spoke to in, in, in almost half a century, <laughs> right, in terms of being able to provide this. And in addition to looking at ways to leverage healthcare dollars, via Medicaid, maybe through, you know, um, expansion of what's covered as benefits and managed care plans, et cetera. While those are certainly, I think, viable opportunities or Medicare Advantage, beyond the healthcare dollar, uh, is there a need for many in the health professions to at least line up and, and add their voice to support expansion of direct funding for legal aid and direct funding for justice in that way? Um, I'm looking for just a quick head nod, I guess, from Maha and Ellen to see if that yeah. sounds right. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. Yeah, vote with your feet right up on Capitol Hill. You know, that's absolutely that voice needs to be lifted. And I think it's symbolic, too, that we see health centers and health systems that say when we put in money for a federal opioid uh, grant, we're going to include funding always just the way we would for a nurse or a behavioral health person. Right. We're always going to include funding for an attorney as well, because we know we're going to need that level of service. Yeah. Well, last kind of plug I'll mention, I see our friend Barbara Siegel on the line as well. And many of you like Barbara have been looking at you know, MLP models along with the ability to take not just the medical and legal partnership, but then bring in community-based organizations, uh, ones that provide direct human services, even though they may not be explicit legal services, um, you know, food, housing, et cetera. And, and also community health workers and promotoras, um, Julie Smithwick and others have mentioned that question as well. And it sounds like there's a burgeoning kind of innovation at looking at how the MLP model can start to also um, bring in, be a touchstone for bringing in other um, diverse organizations and individuals, right? To be able to address this broader panoply of legal aid. By the way, I get a point for using the word panoply. Um, Ellen, yeah, Ma, does that sound absolutely. right? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I like what Maha said and, and it's absolutely true, which is, that legal services is a service in, a, in and of itself, but it's also an enabler of other services. And so if you think of it as kind of the meta social service uh, and the great federal work that DOJ and, and the Access to Justice Commission did to, to surface that and say, you know, mm -hmm. HUD, if you want to make sure you get access, pay, people get access to the services you're providing, you need to blend in yep. access to legal services because the uh, administration of the project is so complex yep. uh, for patients to access. So, yeah. Well, in the final minutes here, uh, Mara, do you want to say something really quick? No, it's okay. Go ahead. Um, in the final minute and a half here that we have, um, I'll just say it sounds like there, and I'm going to share screen in a second here um, to go back to uh, what we have on screen. When it comes to concrete strategies, you've, you've heard a few today. Um, one is the, you know, the medical legal partnership model. Many of you are actively involved in those or some of you are curious to learn more about them. You've heard about the opportunity to leverage those, um, those services, the service integration between medical and legal sides to be able to be an enabler of other services, as Ellen said. You've also heard about access to justice and the office of access to justice and the political will to be able to um, support access to justice through legal aid and other means. Maha that you spoke about and the opportunity to advocate um, for more of that. Uh, there are things in the press even today, right, in terms of concrete opportunities. Uh, today, Illinois just announced that it was going to uh, eliminate the cash bail system. The state Senate in New York just announced that it was going to restore voting rights to those with criminal convictions. And um, one concrete step is just to put that as part of your feed and start to share that with colleagues if you're in a health system so that you track with those news articles and then share them 
to normalize the understanding that this discussion about access to justice to the concept of health justice itself is very much germane. It's not just an interesting kind of cocktail party conversation, it's germane mm -hmm. to the mission of moving upstream. And that part of this is by normalizing these concepts of, of legal aid, access to justice, and the legal determinants of health. This is part of the Paysetter Conversation series. Maha and Ellen, I can't thank you enough for joining us today. And to all of you who joined, we have a, a remarkable turnout. Um, we barely scratched the surface, but just know this is the beginning of a series of conversations. And we will share the copy of the chat with all the resources with you, share the resources directly, share the recording, as well as a follow-up survey. Please complete that. Let us know how we can improve. Share your insights and ideas. Take action in, in the ways that you've heard about today. Um, pick one and just pursue it with your colleagues and stay engaged. Um, this is an ongoing pace setting conversation right now and this year more than ever, we're gonna need your help to do this together. Thank you all. Best of, uh, best of luck with all your work and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks, thanks everyone. Thanks.